Uh, when I was coming up with the title for this talk, I had a bit of a problem because I didn't want to scare people. Uh, no one would vote for it then. Uh, so there's a bit of a pun in this title. I don't know if anyone, if you caught the pun, there's a very like very bad joke in the title. Anyone, anyone didn't catch it? Great, because it would destroy the point of the talk. Anyways, uh, so who am I? I'm Umar. Uh, I work in, 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 during the daytime. I work as an iOS developer at Garena. Uh, during the nighttime, I like to. I'm a member of the Church of Functional Programmers. I like to uh, evangelize functional programming all the time. You can ask my friends. I'm really actually, actually quite annoying because I talk about Haskell quite a lot and stuff. So uh, yeah. Anyways, so this talk, if you haven't guessed it already, it's about functional reactive programming. Uh, and I know, I know, I know. You guys are probably, like some of you know what it is. Are probably, yeah, yeah, cool. So most of you probably are probably like, what the, f what the hell is this? And Jules, I agree with Jules here. Like, there's a lot of buzzwords, right? Like functional, reactive, and it doesn't really give you an idea of what exactly it means, right? I mean, what the hell? I mean, you might know functional programming because, you know, passing functions around and shut up. What the hell is reactive programming? And it's a good question. I think it's a very bad name, and it actually refers to a lot of things. So there's another, another name, another, thing, it's another title it's known by, uh, compositional event systems. Uh, it's, not my, it's not my invention. It's, I, I got, got it from the web. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is how you can model events, asynchronous events, in a way that's composable. So, and the compositality, the composition part is so is quite important. I think it describes FRP a lot better than the word FRP itself. So, yeah, that's what this talk is going to be about. Uh, for, okay. But yeah, firstly, why does this even matter? Why the hell should I care about this, right? Uh, good question. So a bit of, bit of philosophy here first. The world is, the world is asynchronous, right? When you think about the world, uh, you don't have a nice steady stream of synchronous inputs coming in in an orderly fashion. That's not how the world runs. That's how CPUs work. That's not how the world runs. I mean, you'll have actors. You'll have a lot of independent events that are happening concurrently all the time. And it's very hard to coordinate these things. And when you're writing programs, and programs that we write, programs need to interact with this world. They need, to, they need to talk to this asynchronous world. And I mean, when you think about it, user interface, for example, is asynchronous. The user may type something and decides to change his mind. Uh, when you're, when, whenever you go out of a CPU box, you send a network request, for example. You never know the network request might, not never, might never reach because there's a war in Iran and or someone's just destroyed the network cable or something. I mean, the world is asynchronous because of that. And because it's asynchronous and programs need to interact with this, this is actually relevant if you're writing real world programs. So, but, I mean, as a legitimate question, we already have mechanisms to deal with this, right? I mean, we have OP, people call it the observer pattern. Uh, we have also called delegates, listeners, callbacks. I mean, we have it. So life's great. It's like, go away. We don't need this new shit. So, and I mean, Vader has a point here. Like, why do we need to challenge our pre-existing stuff? I mean, all this stuff works already, right? So why does this even matter? Well, here's a few problems with it. Okay, so I'll just give you a brief demo, a brief like highlight of how the observer pattern works. It's quite simple. It's quite simple. We have a protocol or an interface in Java. So, for example, let's say, okay, let's say, for example, that we're going to model the Death Star blowing up. And yeah, the Empire is still using Objective C because, you know, somehow Swift didn't work out in the Empire. So, they had to stick with Objective C for some reason. I don't uh, ask them why. Anyways, so we have a protocol, Death Star Delegate, Death Star Observer, whatever. Anyone can implement this protocol, right? In your Death Star class, you'll have a property keeping track of that observer. So, you'll have a property called Death Star Delegate. And then, whenever, when the Death Star does blow up, you will send the event, okay, delegate, Death Star just blew up, all right? And, and in Darth Vader, the Darth Vader class that actually implements this method, I'll just log saying, okay, shit, I need to hire better stormtroopers because you know, these guys suck at, def at defending the Death Star. But I mean, that's just a brief idea of how the delegate pattern works or how observers or listeners work, right? I mean, it's quite, it's quite straightforward. You basically have a protocol, you delegate events, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I mean, this is fine, so seemingly, right? We also, I mean, but if you look at it, there are a few problems here. And let's look at the problems over here, okay? First problem is the order is unpredictable. What, I'm, what do I mean by that? Now, this was one network of event chains, but imagine you have a very complex network of events. 
So you have three or four different events, like you're waiting for one network response, and the response comes in, you wait for some user input, then you do something else after that. If you have a complex network, it's very hard for you to look and find out what exactly the graph of the network is, because it's very hard to read this sort of code, because it's all over the place, right? So if you think about it, when you're writing asynchronous programming, you're thinking you're writing asynchronous pipelines, right? You're writing fl event flows. But it's very hard to visualize those flows when you write code in this sort, in this sort of way. Another problem is I may miss certain events because I didn't start listening, at listening fast enough. Let's say I'm, I'm listening to some user input and, or, and the user started typing already, but I didn't assign my listener at that point in time, so I'll miss those events. How do I deal with that? It's, it's, a, it's a complicated problem. I need to clean up my listeners. So like in Objective-C, that's why we have a weak reference. You saw the weak thing. That's why we have it there. So you know, uh, the OS doesn't keep, because it's, otherwise you have a cyclic reference, and you'll keep on holding access to that resource. And you want to clean it up. And this is also another problem we face with listeners. Another problem is that you might, because you're dealing with asynchronous events, and because the pipeline isn't exactly clear, you might have cases where some event triggers, some event triggers, some event, which triggers the event that started the whole thing. And it's very hard to find this thing because, once again, you're in this, you have this mess of, mess of observers, and you might have some accidental recursion occurring over there. And the biggest problem of all, I mean, uh, enemy number one, we have too much state that we need to handle because we're keeping track of all our observers ourselves. So we have to keep to keep the state, the state machine that you know uh, that is basically the the logic of our application. It needs to be managed by whoever is observing that. So I need to know. I need to have a variable saying, okay, I listen to this point. Then once I've done, I'll do something else, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All this state. It needs to be, is, is your responsibility, basically. And this is a problem, especially when you're doing things like multi-threading, where, where you want to minimize state as much as possible, because otherwise, if you're doing multi-threading, you'll have to have locks and shit all over, all over your code base. So these are problems with observers. And uh, I mean, they're, they're, they're there, and they've been around for a while. So what else? Another problem we have. And this is a, very, this is a popular image taken from the internet. But, if you use callbacks, right? If any of you has used callbacks, uh, Node.js, jQuery, et cetera, any, any, any callback key based API, what happens is if you have dependent operations, dependent asynchronous operations, your code will look like that in no time. And the reason is it's, it's quite obvious because every time you add a new dependency, you add a level, nice level of the pyramid, right? So you have this nice pyramid of doom slowly, slowly approaching, and this makes your code very unreadable very, very fast. Uh, you're, you're, and it's quite dangerous because you know your your scoping rules are all screwed up, especially if you're using JavaScript. Oops. Yeah. So, anyways, this is a problem. Uh, callback hell is the real problem. And uh, here's a quote from uh, here's a quote from a very influential person who says that as humans, right, we are geared towards mastering or visualizing static relations rather than dynamic ones over time. Uh, and this is not me, this is Dijkstra. And Dijkstra over here, he's talking about goto, by the way. Uh, the goto statement, he's talking about the goto statement which would redirect logic all over the place. And he's trying to argue that that's very hard to read as programmers. And that, that is very hard to read if you think about it because you have code, your logic branches are going all over the place. It's very hard for you to visualize from one standpoint, okay, this is exactly the flow of my application. And that's where FRP slash compositional event systems come in. All right, that's, that's the problem that they're trying to solve over here. Okay. So uh, before I, the way I'm going to go over FRP, it's very, it's very, it's very simple. I'm first going to talk about imperative programming and how imperative programming solves stuff. All right. So what happens in imperative programming? We will describe computation as a series of actions, and we will modify some program state. Right. So here's a simple example. Let's say I have a bunch of numbers. I want to find all the even numbers. Right. I'll just do have a loop through the numbers. I'll have an array that maintains my even numbers. And every time I get an even number, I push it to the array, right? It's quite simple, simple stuff. Uh, the, the, the important part here is I have this backing store called array. It's a separate a sep a backing store called even. And it's a separate array of, sh array of stuff right? That, that I need to handle. Now, if I was to write this thing in a functional way, in functional programming, what we do is we describe what we want rather than how we want it done. Or what that means is, in other words, we describe the transformation we want from an input to an output, right? And, and we keep it as a static sort of a thing. We don't have a, a separate backing store. So for example, this, the functional way of writing this would be, I have a numbers array. I have this function called filter. 
the filter will take a will take a predicate function that will basically apply this function on every member of that array, and if that predicate passes yes, it'll return me a new array. And if you notice, in this case, I don't have a separate backing store. I don't have a separate place where I need to keep track of, okay, these are my even numbers. In this case, the relation or the flow or the transformation from my inputs to my output is quite clear. It's just this one function, and it's a clear transformation. There's no need for anything to touch the outside world or to touch any other backing store outside, outside of this. So it's, in other words, in, like, like I said earlier, we're modeling the computation of the transformation of value from one value to another form of a value. And it's declarative. By declarative, I mean it's static. What I see there is not going to change, right? It's once you look at it, you know what's going to happen. It's not like you need to process it or mentally run the algorithm through your mind to find out what's going to actually happen. It's declarative, the rule, the rule is there. You just, you just need to know what the rule means. It's pure. By pure, a pure function is a function that, for any given set of, set of inputs, will always return the same set of outputs. Okay, so it's pure because this filter function, whenever, whatever, whenever I give it the same inputs, it will always return to me the same amount of same output. And purity is awesome because of purity, you get multi-threading for free because in, in because you don't have any external state variable, you don't have any external resource that you need to control concurrent access to. Everything is pure, everything is a function, you can pass them around, you can, you can shoot values in them, and you can do them in different threads, easy, easy, you get concurrency for free. This is awesome, and thread safe, so it's great. And best part of all, it's composable. What I mean when I say composable, I mean you can chain different functions together. So if you start off with very simple little blocks, you have, you define your given set of very simple functions, map, filter, fold, etc., and you can build more complex functions using those functions at the base. Because essentially what you're doing is you're, or you're passing functions around. It's very easy for you to compose functions together. Because it's very easy to compose them together because what is a function? It takes in some value, it does some shit, it returns you some, it returns you, it returns you value, right? And you can see it's very easy to attach another function that does the same thing. So it takes the resultant value, does some more shit, and then returns you another value. It's very easy to build your chain or build your blocks together and that's what I mean when I say composable. It's very nice. To, it's very nice to use in that sense. So the main concept in FRP is to apply this principle of composability to asynchronous flows. Very simple. How do we do that? Let's get to that. So the way we do that is we have this concept of a signal. All right, and that's why that was the pun in the title: signaling and a callback hell. So what is a signal? A signal represents a stream of values over time. And I know that doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, how, what exactly do you mean by that? What I mean is that my asynchronous operations, like an API call, a UI input, a timer, these things will return signals to me. So when I do an asynchronous API call to, let's say, like get stuff from Telegram, like, like in the previous talk, that call itself will return me something called a signal, which will represent, which will contain or encapsulate the values that that, that uh, asynchronous operation will return, instead of me passing a callback function to that, to, to that method. A signal can send three kinds of events. Uh, it can send a next event. A next event it sends whenever it, does that signal has new values coming in. So for example, in case of a UI input, as if, let's say I have a signal that represents uh, every time the user clicks a button. Every time you click a button, it'll be a next event. So next, 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 so on. That's it. Simple. So next event, next event simply contains values. You can have an error event. An error event says, "Okay, crap, something happened. I need to close the signal now." So in this case, the user disconnected the mouse. I throw an error, error event saying, "Okay, the user disconnected his mouse." Blah blah blah. Do some shit. Send an error message. Or I can send a completed event, which means that, okay, I have no more events to give you anymore. So, if, so once I send a completed event, that means I can no longer send any more next events after, after that. All right, so like when my program ends, I'll just send a completed event to finish it. So, I mean, this sort of thing doesn't really, like you may think, okay, so what, right? Doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, when you're, I mean, you, when, you're, when you're talking about sending events, who are you sending them to, right? When you're sending events, you're sending events to subscribers. So first concept, you have a signal. Another concept, you have a subscriber. 
Because so you, these signals can be subscribed to. So here's some here's some sample. Uh, I can listen to next events from a signal. So let's say I have a signal representing all Lannisters, all right? Because Lannisters are cool, and I will log every time I receive a new sig new next event from a Lannister, saying, okay, this guy is a true Lannister, all right? If you notice the type in the function, the type in the next event is, name, is, is a string name. So the values I'm sending in, the value inside the next event is, 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 is of type string, basically. So, and what I do in this is, okay, I send, I send Cersei, I send Jamie, and when I send Cersei, this thing will be logged. So it will say Cersei is a true Lannister. When I send Jamie, it will say Jamie is a true Lannister. Then I send completed, all right? And I'm done. Oops, I forgot Tyrion. So then I send Tyrion, and nothing is logged there because, oops, sorry, Tyrion, not a true Lannister. Oops, yeah. So, but, but the point is because uh, it's, it's completed already, there's no, no more, the, the subscriber will no longer receive any more next events. But the basic idea is here is that we can subscribe to these events. So, like we can subscribe to next events, we can subscribe to completed events, we can subscribe to error events as well. So, and if you want to create a signal, so that's the next question, right? So, okay, that's fine. How do I create, create a signal? It's quite easy. Uh, these samples I'm talking, taking, by the way, these code samples, they're in particular from Reactive Cocoa, which is an FRP implementation for iOS. Other implementations, like uh, RxJava, RxSwift, et cetera, they exist. And the API is pretty much similar, although I'll explain the differences a little later. When I create a signal, it's quite simple. Let's say I have, a, let's say I have, a, I have some asynchronous operation where I do my sign in, right? This is my operation. It takes a callback function. All I do is in every signal creation method will take a met will take something as an will possibly pass a subscriber as an argument, and you will pass uh, the subscriber whatever events you want based on the result. So in this case, for example, if I get an error, I send the error message to the subscriber. Otherwise, I send whatever shit I need to send, right? It's it's, it's fairly simple to convert asynchronous callback key methods into signals. It's quite easy to do. <laughs> So, okay, I know what you guys are thinking by, by this point, and I, and I actually agree with you. It's getting a little dull, right? Yeah. Like, this does not make any sense. How the hell does it solve anything? It's just complicating my async process. I had some nice delegate first, and now you ruin this with all your signal bullshit. And uh, how does this solve anything? And uh, so far, I agree with you. But we haven't reached the best part yet. Composition. That's the best part. That's where this thing becomes exciting. Signals, like values, can be transformed via higher order functions. What, I, what do I mean by that? Let's say I have a signal containing stuff of val type A, and I want to convert that to a signal containing stuff of type B. A uh, common example here would be, for example, I, I get some input, text input from a field, and I want to actually get the length of the text that the user entered. Now, how do I do that? Well, we have a function that transforms things from one type to another type, to, to values of another type, and it's called map in, in, the, in the functional world. So if you have a list and you apply a map function on it, it will apply the map function to every element on the list and will return to you a new list. Same thing in signals. A, a map on a signal will apply a function to A and it'll return B, and it will basically return a signal of, signal of A to a signal of B. And in this case, so here's, here's what I did earlier. So I have my Lannister signal. And let's say I want to get the name, the length of the name. So I basically map this function. I provide a mapping function that will convert the string to a string to a length and basically perform that perform that transformation. So you're transforming the signal into another signal, and this thing will return to you a new signal. Okay. So similarly, I can do other. If I let's say I don't want to get all the events of a signal. Let's say I want to apply a certain predicate. Because let's say the user is doing some input, but I don't want to send an API call for every user input. Let's say I want to stop the user, or I only want to send API queries when the user's text query is beyond len2 or something. Well, we have something for that too. Once again, in the functional world, we have this thing called filter, which basically applies a predicate function and will filter out stuff. So if you apply a filter to a list, it'll apply the predicate function and then give you a list with the stuff that passes the predicate. Same thing in function, same thing in signals. This signal, if, this, if, the Tyr if the Lannister's name is Tyrion, it will not pass any more next events. So the, signal that you, so the signal that you return from it will have all the Lannisters except Tyrion, because he's not a true Lannister. Okay? So similarly, if you have 
multiple signals and you want to combine their values, their next values, all right? So I have many signals coming in and I want to combine their values into one signal. I have this thing called merge. And here's an example, like, so let's say I'm, I'm choosing, I have a signal representing all the contenders for the Iron Throne. And, what I will, and these are all signals, the Lannisters, the Baratheons, Starks, Tyrells, these are all signals representing next events containing names of those people. And I want to have a signal that represents all these guys together. So what I apply is I apply a merge operation, and the merge will basically combine next events from all these signals and give me a signal that represents all these next events together. That's, that's, that's a merge, right? So with these things, right, before we get there, so, so basic idea here is that instead of me manipulating values myself with use, by using state like I did in delegates and callbacks, I'm now performing transformations on the signal itself and that's using higher, higher order functions. So here's a slightly complex example, like bear with me for a bit. There are cases where you run into a sort of thing where you have a signal of signals, all right? And I know what you're thinking, but let me just explain to you why this happens or why it's so common. Now, because we represent all our asynchronous operations as signals, so when I do an API call, it'll return me a signal, right? So let's say I have a, I have a signal representing the Khaleesi in, in Game of Thrones. And let's say she does an asynchronous operation where she fetches dragons, right? And she can't find her dragons because she keeps losing them. And she sends Jorah Mormon to send, find her dragons. This, this asynchronous operation will return a signal to you, right? So if you think about it, I have a map function there. The map function returns a signal to me. So if you look at the, think about the type of this thing, this thing returns to me a signal of signals, right? And this sort of thing would be quite common because we're modeling all our asynchronous operations as uh, signals. So this sort of thing, you'd be like, yeah, like what, right? Like, yo dog, I heard you like signals, so I put a signal in your signal, right? Like, what the hell, right? Why would I, what's, why should I even worry, worry about this? This is, this is weird. So uh, turns out, actually this sort of thing is quite common and there is a very nice solution to it. It's called flat map. Uh, and flat map, what it does, as the name says, it flattens. So you have a signal containing a signal of A, it'll convert that to a signal of A, and then it maps. So it'll apply, that, apply a mapping function from A to B. It's quite simple. So, and uh, this, sort of, this, this flat map is also called bind. So if you're from Haskell background, uh, you probably know what I'm saying, you're probably winking at me right now. Uh, yeah, signals are, like, you can say they're monads in a way, but and that's, the, that's a side note. Anyways, so, uh, so through these operations, through these, uh, operators and higher order functions, we can see, we can, let's, let's see how to apply this sort of thing, right? So let's say now we have, a, we have several dependent asynchronous operations, how will, how will we write the code? Something like this. What we'll have is, we have a login, some asynchronous, asynchronous operation, we apply a then on it, which takes the result of that uh, and calls this, calls this thing. This thing returns another asynchronous operation, we apply a flat map on that, and this op is another asynchronous operation which you subscribe to at the end of the day. So the point here is your pipeline is quite clear. You first do, you first log in, then you load all the cached messages, and then you'll fetch all the messages after this stuff, and then you present an error if you have an error, blah, blah, blah. So the point is your, your pipeline that you, that, that you wanted or you had in mind becomes clear. You don't need to worry about delegates, observers, callbacks, etc. So, and pipelines are a big thing. Because if you think about it, the way we think about asynchronous code is often in terms of pipelines. You'll have some user, asynchronous user inputs flow coming in, and you'll apply some transformations on them, you'll have some logic on them, and then you'll have some other asynchronous operation coming in, and then you'll have some UI interaction as a result of that, right? And a lot of, our, a lot of the code we write is this transformation in itself, is this pipeline in itself. And if you can express that pipeline in its pure form as a pipeline, it's great. So, and so it's declarative. And because it's declarative, it's got, it's got a clear ordering. You can see from the order, okay, this step happens first, then this step happens, and this step happens. It's not like delegates where you have to jump all over the code base and find, okay, what exactly triggered this, or in callbacks, same, the same thing, where the same thing happens. It's composable. It's composable in the sense that because everything returns a signal, you can combine them together, you can map them together, you can, you can do all sorts of things you want to do with them, and you can return new signals from them. So you start with a very simple building block, and you can, you can, you can basically create very, very powerful building blocks from this very simple building block. 
And there's no explicit state machine that you have to manage. You don't need to manage your delegates. You don't need to manage the state in an explicit store outside of this. This thing, your pipeline will be self-contained. And the best part, it offers you a unified interface for asynchronous events. Now, if you come from an iOS background, this is, I mean, we have very many different ways to dealing with asynchronous events. We have GCD, we have delegates, we have KVO, we have NS notification, blah, blah, blah. I mean, and it's often, we have, we'll have a lot, of, a lot of wrapper code to deal and just to deal with interfacing these different event propagation mechanisms. Signals provide us a unified interface for all these asynchronous events, which is pretty awesome if you think about it. So yeah, Arnie says, yeah, bye-bye callback hell. Great. But there is obviously a thing. It's not a silver bullet. There are problems with the system. Uh, one of the biggest problems with the system is when uh, to distinguish between host signals and cold signals. I don't have that much time, so I'll go into it. If you want to talk about it with me later, I can go into more detail. But basically, a hot signal is something that's always giving you values. A cold signal is something that will only give you values when, when you subscribe to it. So, and this is something that you need to think about when you're doing reactive code. So uh, yeah, it's not obviously that clear. But good news is, uh, in Reactor Cooker 3 with Swift, they have a, they perform this for you as a type system. So they have different types for you to distinguish, distinguish this. So you don't need to worry about that much. Uh, at the end of it, I want to end with saying Reactor Coco, FRP in general, it's a simple solution. It's not an easy solution. And when I say simple, not easy, I mean it in this way. I mean, again, I'm referring to Rich Hickey's great, awesome talk called Simple Made Easy, which you guys should refer to it. Uh, when you're talking about simple, you're talking, comparing simple with complex. Simple meaning something is composable. It's the minimal amount of abstractions you need to describe something. Complex would be something that's not uniform. You need, you need to have a very complex there are abstractions to describe some process. Easy would be something that is it's subjective. It's something easy to understand, something, you can easy, something that you can very easily do, or you can easily reason about, you can easily read. Hard is something that's the opposite of that. FRP is simple in the sense that you have this one abstraction that covers all these cases. It may, not be very, it may not be very easy, because for someone who hasn't looked at reactor code before, if he looks at it the first time, he might get quite startled, like, what the hell is going on? I can understand my callback eBase code easily. I can understand this stuff. But once you get it, once you get the concept behind it, it's actually not that bad. So that's just like something. That, and this is, not, this is not me saying it. This is the library author who says, basically, that okay, reactor code is simple, not easy. So that done, uh, we have time for questions, I believe. So yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, any questions? Yeah. Other than objective C, do you have any references or languages to implement this function of running on parallel? Yeah, so FRP, as it turns out, has a lot of implementations in a lot of other languages. Actually, the, the Objective C one is actually not a very good one in the sense that because Objective C doesn't have a type system, or doesn't have actually doesn't really have a type system. So it so it's actually not that not as good as other implementations. Uh, for Java, there is an implementation of FRP called Sodium. You should check it out. For Haskell, because it's, Haskell is where this entire thing started out from, there's a lot of implementations. Uh, .NET, uh, there's a RX.NET where a lot of object-oriented versions of Rx came out from. Uh, Eric Meyer is the author of that library. It's a very, very nice library to use. Uh, and that's where a lot of these concepts came about. So basically, FRP libraries are everywhere. There's a JavaScript implementation as well now. There's quite a few, actually. There's RxJS, there's BaconJS, et cetera. So there's quite a few libraries you can use FRP in your code base. Anything for C++? Good question. Uh, there might be. I'm, I'll need to check. You'll need to check. You'll need to double check. With C++, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, I'll double check. C++ has everything else. Yeah, it might have everything. Yeah. Uh, so you talked about the symbols, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. So the thing about Reactor Cocoa itself is that itself is actually quite light. You can implement signals for anything. So for gestures, right? Uh, for gestures, we have a gesture recognizer delegate, right? And you will get the delegate will receive events. Basically, Reactor Cocoa has allows you to send a signal every time a method is invoked. It has a rack signal for selector method on NS object. And what that does is every time that method is invoked, it'll send a signal. 
with the next value. So basically, you can set up that method in your gesture. So basically, you can send, send your gesture recognizer selector as that method. And it'll basically, you'll get signals for free for that just particular gesture, rec gesture recognizer. So the basic idea is that it's actually very easy to create events from your events from other sources. Like if you have a callback function, you can create it quite easily. If you have a delegate, it's quite easy to create as well. So it's very easy to create signals from any, any other event. The library is quite open with that. Yeah. Uh, sorry, can you come again? I didn't hear you. So, yeah. So the, the, the question he's asking is that uh, whether or not testing, or UI testing in particular, how hard is it, or is, it, is there any benefit we get from using this? That's the test question, right? So actually, I would argue that testing is quite easy. Once again, once, and it's easy because all you need to do is you need to mock the signal, right? That's it. In this, in, if you're talking about testing uh, with doing delegates, testing and callbacks, I mean, it's similar. You can, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can mock the delegate. You can mock that. In, and the signal is the same thing. You just need to mock that signal that's producing whatever thing you want to test. And then you can write your test based on the result of that signal. So I would say uh, testing-wise, there's, no, like, there, there's, there's no explicit benefit. But you can do it. It's quite, quite possible to do. And I would say it's quite easy to do using Reactive. So, any other questions? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a pretty good project. So it's a pretty good project. So just take a look at it, and uh, these signals and everything will be much more clear. So this LM is one project, the other project is, uh, so there's a course in Coursera uh, yeah. on uh, Correct. principles of Principle uh, reactive programming. Yeah, it's taught by Martin Ordersky, the guy behind Scala. Yeah, so uh, if you do these things, these two, it will be much more you know, uh, understanding of what all these concepts are. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Yeah, it's right. Elm is pretty awesome. You guys should check it out. It's basically a Haskell implementation. Yes, Mohit. Is there any performance issues or threads related to threads? Uh, good question. For there is gonna be a very slight performance penalty because the methods you write are obviously being nested a lot quite deeply with some with a lot of reactive program machinery. So a very small amount of performance ben performance penalty. We've been using it in production, actually, for a project. And it, so far, we haven't faced anything major, any major performance, performance problems with it. One of the problems with this library in particular, though, is that debugging is a little hard, because you're debugging from very deep stack traces, because the library adds a lot of layers. So that's one potential problem. But performance hasn't been that big a problem, because it's just a lot of callbacks. It's just essentially a lot of, lot of nested callbacks inside the library. But that itself does not affect performance that much, unless you're doing a lot of number crunching or something very, very heavy. But for our case, we haven't noticed it a lot, actually. Yeah, but even that, you have a lot of schedulers, thread schedulers. Yeah. Different types of thread schedulers that you can use, and you can change your performance. Uh, you can change yeah. your performance how you want to score. Yeah. Something I didn't talk about exactly is that with Reactor Coco, you can have signals, or you can basically have it's like you said, schedulers to perform certain signals on. And it's actually quite easy to, quite easy to do. So you can, yeah, you can delegate tasks yeah. to external threads yeah. if you need to. Okay, one more question. We have time for one more question. If there's any more more questions, so anything? All right. Seems like that's it. Okay, guys. Thanks so much.